Welcome to um, Board of Supervisors. I ask that you please stand and join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We had a closed session last week pursuant to Government Code 54956.9. Conference with labor negotiators on SEIU, DSA, CCPSEA with the Director of Human Resources. No action was taken. I'd like to move to the consent agenda. As always, not as always, but most of the time, the items are routine, non-controversial. Does any board member? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to take item five off. Okay. Yes, Mr. Which Three, one? Board five. Okay. Five was already taken. Did anybody want to take the minutes or correspondence off? Okay. Uh, may I have a motion on the two, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 No. Passes on a 5-0. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, could you please come forward and identify yourself and give us what your question is? Joe Kelly. The staff report states 2004 Board of Supervisors established Mountain Ranch Road safety improvements as the second most critical road improvement project in the entire county. This is an integral part of the new Calaveras Criminal Justice Center project. Local funds have been used to begin the design and environmental phases, but securing project funding has been extremely challenging. This is the key that really threw me. The staff report discussion and uh, summary Descri discloses the new Calaveras Criminal Justice Center project. The staff report alternative states Board of Supervisors could choose not to sign the letter of support, not to, uh, not to, affects, not to affects competitiveness for the grant and eliminate the opportunity for securing funding for the new Criminal Justice Center. What was the description uh, of the project used for Measure J information? Reading the letter to Mr. LaHood sounds all positive with bureaucratic government speak, but not one mention of the requested funds being used to offset, relocate, change direction of funds accounted for the construction purposes. Hey, it's your written expressions. I'm just reading them. Do you think Mr. LaHood would like to know the shell game you're in intending? This item concerns me. The June 30th, 2010 cost control report given during the uh, I'm sorry, given during the July 27, 2010 study session of the jail, pardon me, new adult detention facility, another different name, construction cost. It had site access 5800 had the prior of 11309, had the prior of 29910, option two. Then it had the current, 51410, DD plan, $4,444,556,000, budget and cost to complete. It also had, uh, under site access infrastructure, AB 900, 5802, current, 51410, DD plan, $1,162,817. Budget and cost to complete. 5800 and 5802 current and AB 900 total $5,607,373.75. Uh, excuse me, $5,607,373. Budget and cost to complete. Your Tiger II discretionary grant, $4,870,000 with 5802AB900 fund of $1.162817 gives a total of $6,032,817. $6,032,817. What you've done here, or what this is apparently uh, trying to accomplish, it's either going to double up the cost, giving the county a $10,477,373 total value for this 
project out here on Mountain Ranch coming in and with the processing of this jail. But it also freed up current, the 5,800 current, 51410, $4,444,556. $4, and the number two total difference of $425,444, which equates to the $4,870,000. You're bringing money in that are not part of Measure J, which was passed in 1107, and, and then AB 900. So where does the $4,870,000 in savings go? A bond principal reduction for the benefit of Calaveras County taxpayers? In my opinion, you're outside the scope of what was presented and what was voted on as Measure J. I applaud you for Mr. Garcia's aggressive pursuit of new revenues. Now you get to account for it. Are there any sheriff's office personnel being paid for out of Measure J funds? That's my comments. It's all about dollars, and it's all about where where Thank are the you. four million? Mr. Kelly, you brought up many things, um, many of which items which are outside the scope of what we're doing. I will ask our CAO to call you and set up a meeting. We'll go over each of the items that you asked and with Mr. Garcia. Um, I mean, just like the last one, are we paying for a sheriff out of Measure J? That does not have to do with the item before us. Your questions need to be answered, and uh, we will get together with you and answer each one of those. Not only my question needs to be answered, Madam Chair, but I think the people of Calabarras County deserve a hearing on this, either bring back the people on the jail project to sit down and discuss it again, bringing this dollars in, because this goes back to a 2004 board approval of this project. And... It was not, I don't remember it being brought into the fray of Measure J funding. And I believe we're starting to possibly see a potential fraudulent activity going on that has been perpetrated on the people of this county. And I think you need to be very transparent, very clear, very open to the people of Calaveras County. We agree with you on Thank that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Boyce, could you please call Mr. Kelly, set something up with... Doug and uh, Mr. Garcia. Thank you. Uh, hi, Diane Keene, Senator Reyes. I mean, while we're on that, is um, why do I sort of remember that uh, the Mountain Ranch Road safety mitigation funds were part of the, I think it was HPP, the high occupancy something or other, maybe Mr. Garcia can elaborate, and had already been approved. So that was a different project, but I can't. Four. Would you like to hear all my agenda, four, four and five also? No. Or three? Just three. Three? Oh, okay. You'll call for four or five. You, a, you asked it, Paul, and Mr. Walensky asked for five, Paul. Mr. Garcia, would you like to answer that question, Mr. Mitchell? Just, just the one Miss Keene just asked. The first, the first project they referred to. Was you can the, just address the board, please. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. The first project that I, I believe was called into question is funded with Highway Safety Improvement Grant Program funds, and it's scoped for improving the land to include realignment and the installation of a turnout. This is a separate project, which is improvements for the segment of Mountain Ranch Road from State Route 49 to approximately Calvary Drive. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Are there any other questions on item number three? So if my hearing right, then the monies that are in for infrastructure for the entrance of the jail or the infrastructure that's considered for bringing in is not for use on from the Highway 49 to, the, to this property and on out to the new uh, no, there are facility? different different funds. The funds that there are the funds that go from Mountain Ranch into the project are different funds than on Mountain Ranch. It will all be explained to you very so transparent, a, Mr. Yeah. Kelly, okay. when Miss Boyce. So there's a ten million dollar cost of that infrastructure from there to there. 
we will by address adding the, all, Mr. Kelly, we will address all your questions when. One other then. Why wasn't it brought up in, in the letter to Mr. LaHood, and since it's been brought up in this item, that it's very imper imperative that it be done for the building of this project? And why isn't that put in there for Mr. LaHood instead of all this flower bureaucratic government speak? Thank you for your comments on that. Um, you brought up a question. We do have a letter to Mr. LaHood. Are there any additions or changes the board might like to make on the letter? If not, then I'll entertain a motion on item number three. I'll move the item. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Passes on a 5-0. I'd like to move to item four. Mr. Kelly. Joe Kelly, your consent agenda page item four, resolution state, states, waive certain eligibility requirements to allow an, an extra hire of Calaveras Works and Human Services Agency. The Title 24 is stated in the staff report, no employee. The staff report stated the individual was laid off July 2009 and currently making $14.86 per hour. Is the individual still an employee of Calaveras County? If the individual is, the staff report should state it. If she isn't a current county a, or other ineligible employee, why does she need the exception? If there is an exception of rehire, ex expectation of rehire, it should state it. Now, your resolution document states the individual is an extra hire employee of CWHSA. This thing has been so confusing to read. One minute she is an employee, the next minute she's not an employee, and now she is an employee. Why can't they just put it out and state it in the staff report so it can be factually and understood by normal reading of the English language? Where does this rental security deposit revolving loan account program com funds come from? You know the term snafu? This agenda item fits the term. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Good morning, Mary Sawicki, Director of Calaveras Works and Human Services. Um, this agenda item concerns the request to waive the, um, the conflict of interest. We have an employee who actually was laid off uh, over a year ago. She recently came back under an extra hire due to another employee's um, disability, extended disability. During, uh, during her time as coming back as an extra hire, she encountered some issues. She needs uh, some assistance from the CDBG, Community Development Block Grant Rental Loan Program. She is eligible under every other category for the rental security deposit program, except for the fact that she is an extra hire. Um, when the other employee comes back, this person will not have a position. Thank you, Ms. Sawicki. <clears throat> um, are there any other comments from the board? I guess I, I, I would like to see us have this be policy-based, and I have no problem with with this uh, extra hire is a, in, in this case is filling in for somebody has no commitment from the county for employment has no uh, ongoing tie but I think that if we do this for this person that we should have a clear policy that we're doing this for, for uh, such uh, people in that category and uh, I would be more comfortable if we were to write this in that regard so it's a matter of policy. I think it is a good decision. It's a, it's a right thing to do, uh, but I want to make sure that we're not doing it sort of picking individual circumstances, but that it's a function of, of a policy that we set. I guess I look at it a bit differently because this is um, government code 
and it does say exception can be made only after public disclosure and formal approval by the board of supervisors of the county calaveras so i would think that if any of the departments have someone who fits this criteria that it has to be brought to the board public disclosure yes i wouldn't suggest that that in any event that we would uh waive that but that uh as a matter of course that we would would seek people in this category that would that we would hold such a, a public discussion for all such people uh, who applied rather than just one well I mean, the thing is is i don't think very many people are going to fall in this by the time you that's take true. staff time to make that code i don't think the first yeah. time it's come before us is it not mary it's the first time it i've may ever not seen come it. for years again i mean i don't want to put a whole lot of staff time into a policy that, right. that i'd rather just do it on an exception basis it's allowed okay well i can count <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other comments? From I'll the move board? the item, Madam Chair. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes on the <coughs> five vote. Thank you. Thank you item there. five, Mr. Kelly, you have a that question. Was my, actually, well, that so did Mr. Kelly. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Kelly, you have a. Well, if I may, I'd like to hear what Supervisor Walensky has to say first, please. Oh, that's fine. Mr. Walensky, Thank you, would you Joe. like to go first? Yes, the reason I, I pulled this off is uh, that this is part of a, a larger uh, question about what, how we hold elections and, and uh, what is the best way, given our, our counties, both the budget considerations, but also the much more important issue of how you best encourage people to participate in the electoral process uh, by... Uh, and I've talked with a, a number of people about this. Some of us are very old-fashioned and actually believe that going to, you know, having been taken by our parents at age five to the polling places, uh, that, and having done that with our kids, that there's something special about that observation of the democratic process. Uh, and moving to a mail ballot uh, denies some form of interaction that, that I personally treasure. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the county doesn't have the money to pull or the staff to pull this off. One of the features of this is that it's possible in the new open primary that somebody might get 50% plus one. Would that make unnecessary the November election? I believe so. Uh, I don't know how, you know, whether there is any time to, to, uh, decide that based on the outcome of the election. But I, I much prefer that we, if we do make this exception, that it not be based on a feeling that the efficiency of election process is more important than the ability f and for people to participate in ways that are most comfortable and appropriate for them. Uh, so if we make this decision, I'm hoping that this does not uh, indicate that we're moving or set a precedent toward toward going in that direction uh, while we're on it uh, <clears throat> I did speak to Karen and I do support it uh, basically I support it as an exception uh, 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 I don't want to see us start going to more and more mail ballots and, and in fact I have stated publicly in the past that I think one of the great concerns we have in the electoral process today is there are so many absentee ballots. Um, historically, people showed up at the polling booth and, and candidates had representatives there and you could challenge people that are voting to make sure that they're legitimate, etc. And to the extent uh, uh, we do have fraud in the electoral process or to the extent we may have, uh, may have it in the future, uh, I strongly suspect it's not going to come from those that show up at the polling booth. It's going to be those that come uh, the, those that vote uh, through the mail process because there's no way of, uh, uh, of, of checking that, in my opinion, that's very, very successful. Karen may take some exception because I guess you do have to sign your signature and they do check <coughs> signature cards. But uh, uh, you know, I, I think there's something, uh, you know, the, the anonymity 
of, of a mail-in process versus the uh, checks and balances of, of, of a live person showing up at the voter booth. Uh, I much prefer uh, for the legitimacy of the electoral process to have a live person show up at the voter booth. So uh, I, will, I will vote for this on an exception basis. Mr. Kelly, your question, please. Thank you, Joe Kelly. In my opinion, it is not in the best interest of this county, especially if the state is not required to reimburse this county for the expenditure of funds for the election. Correct me if I'm wrong. Doesn't the governor have the legal ability to choose a replacement? If so, let him man up and show his true colors. I thought I, thought I read that when I was researching issues dealing with the acting assessor before the previous election. I'm sorry, primary election. I have, ne now, I have never met Senator Cox. I truly regret it. He is the only elected state representative to personally call me in response to the package I sent him regarding the acting assessor's election, Facebook page, and employment conflict. He asked me to keep him informed. The next package was going to be the $40,000 questionable reduction. It didn't happen. That is another regret. It's too bad this board did not cause an investigation of the $40,000 reduction. The discussion summary of the staff report states countywide election $100,000, countywide mail ballot election $80,000, money that is not included in the current fiscal year budget. Is it prudent to even contemplate this? Kick it back to the governor. Logistic problems, time frame problem, tell the governor, we're sorry. We are the elected representatives of the people of Calaveras. We've determined we, the people of Calaveras, cannot afford it. And why wasn't the issue of the governor's appointment potential presented in the staff report? The Sierra Sentinel keeps putting donkey pen and allegations of corruptions in its paper. Prove them wrong. Vote no. Thank you. Ms. Varney, did you want to answer the question of why it's going to a ballot versus why the governor can't appoint it? I believe it was the time frame that the position is open. I don't believe I can answer that. I think that was up to the governor, and I don't think that um, I have an answer for that. That's okay. Well, Senator Cox was recently reelected, and I think there's a code, isn't there, Jim? On um, I'm pretty current a on uh, time frame. I'm pretty current on county succession, but I don't keep track of state offices, okay. so I'm sorry. Now, I could look it up state, for you, but I don't. Right. I would answer. have I would have to research too. Okay. But to my to my knowledge, um, he had a, a choice. Of okay. um, appointing someone or calling an election, and he chose to call the election. Okay, and if he probably appointed somebody, he'd get accused of something else. Okay. All right. As, as far as um, I, I am, the reason I am bringing this before the board is because I do believe it is in the best interest of the county, not only for financial reasons, because, but because of the short time frame that we have to conduct this election. Like I said, we're we're in the middle of, we would be. In fact, the Secretary of State's office is asking us to um, conduct the canvas of this particular election, the general, I mean, the primary that is being consolidated with, the, with our general. Um, in three days, the law allows for 28 days, but we're being requested to, to um, canvas that election and get the results certified in three days because of the short time frame of if if an election is required in January. So, and the question, yes, um, we may not even have an election in January if um, someone does receive 50% or 50% of the vote in November. So um, I'm concerned about getting all of the work done with the people and the time, money that we have to do this and still um, save the integrity of the election itself. Okay. Thank you. Any questions, Ms. Varney? Uh, 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 nothing. I'm wondering, uh, I'd like Council's uh, opinion about whether we might add to this resolution uh, the, uh, where it states the uh, 
name of the resolution. It says, Resolution in support of conducting the January 4, 2011 special general election for State Senate District 1 as an all-mail ballot election. And I'm wondering whether it could be added without setting precedent for any future election. Oh, yeah. And can we do that in this meeting, or would I, we need to reschedule? I think the fact is it doesn't set a precedent. So if you add that. Um, I just want to. <laughs> really if you want to if you I add that, I don't think it's, a, it's not a problem. So I, I will make the motion as amended. If I'll second that the motion. Any further questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes on a 5 vote. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Bernie. Okay. I'd like to move to public comments. If there's anyone who has an item they'd like to discuss sure. yeah. um, that's within the jurisdiction of this board, five minutes per person. Good morning, Chair Callaway, Board of Supervisors, staff. My name is Tim McSorley, Executive Director of the Council of Governments. I have three announcements that I'd like to uh, give the board. Number one is on September 1st, uh, we will be holding a um, presentation update on the Wagon Trail project, and I'd like to invite the board and staff to uh, come and, and uh, see where we are on the status of the project. We're studying a number of alternatives, uh, alt alignment alternatives, and it's also a uh, prelude to the beginning of the scoping, uh, which is the official start of what's called project approval and environmental documentation. That scoping meeting is scheduled, and it's the second of my announcements, is scheduled for September 9th uh, at Bret Hart Multipurpose Room. It's a public meeting that, uh, again, begins uh, all the environmental process uh, for the project. The third announcement. Uh, and, um, I'm sorry. You said the Bret Hart at the theater there? Uh, no, the multipurpose room. The, the new multipurpose room from 6 to 8. 6 to 8, yes. thank you. And then the third announcement, uh, and I think I've mentioned this before, is on October 13th, we will be hosting the uh, California Transportation Commission Town Hall at Ironstone Vineyards. Um, it's, that begins at 8.30 and runs until noon. Um, but on the 12th, there is something, too? I haven't got there yet. Oh, sorry, Mr. McSorley. Um, the town hall forum will be uh, essentially an opportunity for uh, members of the public and members of the community to come forward and ask questions about transportation issues relative to um, Calaveras and the Foothill region. We have co-sponsors, uh, Mariposa, Tuolumne, Amador, and Alpine, so we're doing it as a, as a regional uh, project. And then, yes, on October 12th, the evening before, we are having a reception for the uh, commissioners at the uh, historic Murphy's Hotel. That will be an opportunity to meet more informally with the uh, commission and commission staff. And if you have any questions, we'd be more than happy to answer. That's at the hotel. I thought it was at Ironstone. No, the, the town hall is at Ironstone. The evening before is at the hotel. Time? Um, the uh, reception starts at 6.30, and there, and there will be some formal uh, invitations going out uh, in the very near future. Any questions about the story? Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Thanks, Pam. Anyone else have an item they'd like to address? Joe Kelly. In case anyone was wondering, San Luis Obispo County hired a new director of planning and building, $131,789 salary, $69,842 in benefits, 53% of the salary, $201,631 dollars total. He has a master's degree in international environmental policy. And General McChrystal will be teaching at Yale. The previous conflict of interest issue reminds me, Supervisor Thomas and Madam Chair Callaway, you have never responded, written or verbally, to me of your perceived and publicly state public statement of my having a conflict of interest regarding my application for the Assessment Appeals Board. Madam Chair Callaway, I'm still waiting for your response. Supervisor Thomas, forget it. I think the voters in your district are going to throw you under the bus. And that is my hope. Thank you. Does anyone else have an item?
Hi, Jean Turpin. I'm the chairman of the Calaveras County Republican Party. And I wanted to share with you today that the Calaveras County Republican Party is adamantly opposed to the Strategic Growth Council Planning Grant. The grant would put the county under the auspices of State Assembly Bill 32. It's a cap and trade bill, regardless of whether that is suspended in the November election. So I would urge all of you to, uh, I understand that you're applying for the grant. I would urge you to stop and it's done. Uh, it's, it's done. Have you sent it in yet? Yes. It has sent in. Well, if you are approved for it, I would urge you all to um, not accept the money because of the limits that it would place on this county and the burdens that um, the, assemb the portions of Assembly Bill 32 would place on our small businesses. Thank, Thank you. you Mr. Are there any other issues before the board? Five minutes per person, topics that are under our control. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Les Martin, Valley Springs. Uh, on November 10th, 2009, I addressed the I'm board. sorry, Les, what was that? Uh, November 10th, uh, 2009, okay. there was a uh, consent ag agenda item for um, the disposition of some surplus material in that there was a, quite a large amount of construction equipment. And I talked with, I, I believe it was CAO Lawton at the time. Um, my request at that time was I would like to see the net value received by the county on the sale of this equipment and where it went. Um, the only thing I'm asking for is, is there some way I could get a detailed spreadsheet of the items that were on that list of uh, November 9th and what they actually sold for, the net return to the county? I'm sure that can be arranged. Normally, yes. the money, the normally, it depends on where the equipment was bought. For example, if the money, if a piece of equipment was bought from the road funds, the yep. money goes back into the road funds. Yep. If it was bought from the general fund, the money goes back into the general fund. Right. But we will set that Thank up. You. Thank you. I'm Thank sure. you so very much. Yeah. What, basically, what I'm looking for is the auction results on it. I don't care where where the money went. I just want to know how much money we were receiving for for the equipment. So and yeah. maybe we, next time you can go to the auction and bid up. Hey, there we go. We'll do it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. You're welcome, okay. Mr. Martin. Are you suggesting less be a ringer for the county? <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> suggesting he's got to come in with the, the fun. Does anyone else have an item they'd like to discuss? <clears throat> okay, thank you. We're going to move to item seven. A resolution appointing one, one in-home supportive services consumer to the in-home supportive services advisory committee. Thank I, you. Before we get into this, I have a question for council. If that's all right. yeah. I, I'm trying to sort out uh, between the uh, original the legislation that, that set up the choices for counties on, on the establishment of public authorities, there were several different organizational uh, structures. And one was if that the board would sit as the IHSS public authority. The question is, for, for me, whether similar to uh, what we do with air pollution control and other uh, separate uh, responsibilities of the board, we should reconvene as the IHSS public authority for this discussion or whether we can hold this as we've got it agendized as the Board of Supervisors. And it may take a little bit of background uh, because there's more than we have our own county ordinance, but we also have the underlying uh, legislation. And I'd like to make sure we reconcile those. If well, you raise a good point. I, um, I, without spending, say, taking a break and spending some time, maybe the conservative thing would be to uh, convene as the uh, as the board. 
Okay, and then my second question is, given the way this is agendized, can we do that properly today? Um, can we start, we started listing. And yes. by the way, I have, I, no, I very no, much support the, the yeah. person being on this board, yeah. but I want to make yeah. sure that we do it in the proper fashion. Yeah, well, you the, need this is, serves as the agenda for that board. Okay, well, okay. So. All right, in that case. Mary, did yeah. you want to? The, the IHSS Advisory Committee actually um, is a committee that oversees the program, not necessarily the public authority. Originally, when the public authority was created, there was advisory boards created to start the public authority, but that was then the subsequent legislation said we would like to keep a voice of both providers and consumers in the program to make sure for good quality assurance so that there's constant feedback from that group. So it's actually the IHSS advisory group is actually over the entire program. It, it deals with the social workers, it deals with um, the public authority, et cetera. So it's actually larger than that. Um, and I want to be real clear about that. The, yeah, my the, question the was only in relation to our own processes yeah, here. As to the county process on that, I'll leave that to your discretion. I don't, I don't have a problem doing it. Do any of you have a problem no, not doing at all. it? We will adjourn as the Board of Supervisors and reconvene as the in home supportive services what? Public Authority Board. Board? Okay. I, may I have a motion on this item? And yes. there any questions? I will make the motion to uh, make this appointment uh, with enthusiasm. Okay. <laughs> I'll second the motion. <laughs> All in favor? This is Aye. Aye. with enthusiasm. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, thank you. Pass us on a 5 0. We'll re we will adjourn as the in home supportive services board and reconvene as the board of supervisors thank you i'd like to um steve did you need to yes. take a break for number eight um are we all set up to okay we may want to sort of get this up and running and while while they're doing that i'll i'll introduce the topic uh, you all may remember that we had some discussion about the boards uh the the amount of money that the board contributes to, to be a member of this JPA. And that is the Upper McCallamy River Watershed Joint Powers Authority. Uh, there have been a number of changes, both in the original charter and mission and, and projects for this organization. And during the course of our discussion about our contribution, uh, people came to the conclusion that it would be a good idea to, to have a review of the current and, and an update. So we're talking about the, pro, uh, the following things, the authority's history, programs, and tentative budget for fiscal year 2011 with a focus on what uh, projects and, and issues are addressed here in Calaveras County. And this is Rob Alcott, uh, who has managed this uh, JPA for some time, uh, former formerly from East Bay Municipal Utility District, but is certainly independent uh, and separated from that in this current role. Thank you, Steve. Um, just for the record, before I worked for East Bay Mud, I worked for Colorado Irrigation District, so I don't want folks to <laughs> my allegiances to the East Bay folks. And in fact, I developed a little bit of appreciation for the dynamic between what it takes to get things done up in the foothills, especially with water resource issues, when you have to deal with downstream interests. In, in our case, on the column, it's East Bay, when it was Colorado Irrigation District, it was, was SMUD, you know, that, that dynamic was up and down the, the Sierras and, and the state. So I have been uh, working as a staff person for this authority since it was established back in in August of uh, 2000, so it's, it's our 10th year anniversary. And as I was pulling together this information, I was having an opportunity to reflect back on it. It was a good question, so this was a good idea from our last board meeting, Steve, but it, it got me to coalesce and succinctly try to present what we have been doing and what we are about or poised to do. I walked you through about 14 slides, and uh, I think it gives you a good refresher and maybe for some of you a new background, and we'll talk a little bit about what our planned activities are and what the budget situation is. 
And I believe you're making the same presentation to the Amador Board of Supervisors. Yes, ma'am. We'll go over to see our friends in the Amador Board. Yeah, you can be up. I'm in trouble. Sit down. Just like home. Okay. No, that's all right. I appreciate it. Okay. So four basic things I want to cover. We'll talk about our background, our history. There have been the initial JPA agreement and two amendments, and then I'll kind of briefly go over what the authority has accomplished over the past 10 years. Then we'll talk some about the Integrated Regional Water Management Act that was adopted and actually amended in 2009. That's becoming the central focus of our activities. And with that, I'll talk specifically about what's programmed for this coming fiscal year and then what the budget aspects of that are. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. So going back to Steve's observation, the whole concept of OMRA as a JPA came in large part because of one thing that seemed to bring the Foothill interests, the Amador Calaveras interests, Alpine, as well as East Bay. It was the fear of something that brought us together. And the fear, if you recall, was a debacle as we reflect back on it now, but the whole electric energy deregulation process that was adopted back in the late 1990s that was driven by the high cost of energy in California. And one of the things the CPUC wanted to do was to cause the energy independently owned energy companies, PG&E, Southern Cal Edison, they wanted to basically get them to divest their hydropower, their generating assets, and become basically retail providers. That situation galvanized the folks that became OMRA because of the concern that the McCallum River project, PG&E's project 137 up river on McCallum, would go to a private owner. And there was a lot of speculation whether that private owner would come from even the West or the United States or even Scottish Power was an active participant in discussions about what would happen with divested generating assets. So one of the things that took place was there was a coalition of discussions and we had some informal meetings beforehand, but it motivated the organizations that are now part of OMRA to create the Joint Powers Agency. And a lot of legal work, a lot of political work went into creating the organization back in 2000. Maria was on the board at the time, was very, very much involved. And basically that OMRA became the public ownership option that at that point hadn't been contemplated as part of the CPUC proceeding for PG&E and others for getting rid of their projects. And what happened eventually was that the court approved PG&E's bankruptcy reorg plan and consequently the threat to having PG&E's generating assets owned by outsiders was removed and consequently that motivation that caused OMRA to be created went away. But OMRA has persisted over the past seven or eight years because of a number of other activities. A couple of observations about the first JPA agreement, just the negotiating part of it. The fact that we were able to come to an agreement on something was a notable accomplishment and I'm sure you can appreciate that. The first agreement, the water agencies were voting members and the counties were associate non-voting members. And the reason for that was there is an element in California law that precludes counties from owning hydropower assets that were built prior to a certain 1970s date. And since that was the circumstance with the PG&E project on the McCallamy, Calaveras and Amador and Alpine counties couldn't be full members because they couldn't be owners. The authority's purpose at the time was pretty straightforward. It was to acquire, operate and maintain the project and with some of the revenues, excess revenues, to develop watershed projects which according to the JPA were any types of projects that improved the environmental condition, water quality or water supply in the watershed. There were other key terms in the agreement 
that address the finances, liability, governance, staffing, water rights, those kind of things. There was no budgeting specifically required on an annual basis. The idea was voluntarily members would contribute money to make the acquisition work, and the details would be worked out on a go basis. Since obviously the acquisition never presented itself, those were never executed. And then finally, the first governing board meeting was held a few years ago on the 15th of this month. And since the PG&E reorganization was approved, there have been two amendments made to the JPA agreement. And these were generally made because of the changing circumstances. One of the primary amendments in 2005 was that the purpose was expanded. Basically, the pursuit of PG&E's project was no longer on the screen. So the expanded purpose was to enhance the Columbia River water supply and protect water quality in the Bayou. That is the articulated purpose in the second amendment to the JPA agreement. It's also that amendment that included the counties as voting members, full voting members of the authority. And also, I didn't mention it before, but there was a three-tiered voting structure with the original JPA, in large part because of the liability and the obligations attached to operating and maintaining Project 137. But that three-tiered voting structure was eliminated with the 2005 amendments. So it's equalized voting. Each member gets one vote, and generally it's a majority vote that is required for an action. And then in 2008, as we were going to finish up some work we were doing, the Integrated Regional Water Management Act was gaining steam. And we recognized there was an opportunity for UMR to take a lead role in that capacity. So several amendments were made, including we added water supply projects to our potential activities. We expanded our boundary. The earlier additions only had the authority's focus on the upper McCulloch River watershed, which is basically Highway 49 upstream up into Amarillo Calaveras and Alpine counties within the watershed boundary. But now, and I'll show you a map in a moment, our area of interest is beyond that today. And then finally, we added regional water supply planning, the IR Cup, which is that integrated region. Thank you. It's a conjunctive use project. Yeah, it's been a while. And the raised lower bear is potential UMR projects or programs. So that's the quick, brief summary of the three different JPA agreements. Today's members, Amador County, we refer to them on budget purposes as the Amador entities. And it's Amador County, Jackson Valley Irrigation District, along with the Amador Water Agency. Calaveras County, along with CCWD and CPD, constitute the Calaveras entities. And Alpine County Water Agency and Alpine County collectively represent the Alpine entities. And then East Bay Mud is representing portions of Contra Costa and Alameda counties. So real quickly here, the original JPA, as I mentioned, the purpose was to acquire PG&E's Mocha River project. The activities in those three or four years focused on creating the opportunity to acquire the project. So we sponsored public ownership legislation, testified before various legislative committees. One of the successes was we were able to organize this kind of an odd set of relationships between East Bay legislators and political legislators that were supportive of the legislation creating this public ownership opportunity. We hired a number of experts to advise us on the acquisition issues. And we testified before the California Public Utilities Commission in favor of the public ownership alternative. When that all concluded, when PG&E's Rio plan was approved, the second, what I refer to for the purposes of this presentation, is phase two from the second or the first amendment JPA agreement, looking at water supply options and water quality issues. The authority secured in several grants a total of $937,000 to perform a watershed assessment, develop what we call the WARMF model. So a watershed assessment and risk management framework model. It's public models. It's used to predict water quality based on changes in the environment. 
prepared an upper Montgomery watershed management plan, driven in large part by the results of the study, and as an adjunct to that, developed a septic system management plan, in large part because one of the findings from the watershed assessment was that while the water quality in the upper Montgomery River is generally quite good, there are some areas of concern, and a lot of it has to do with the call form issues in areas that are adjacent to developed properties. Also developed some wildfire behavior models, funded the public school watershed education program that many associate with Mary Ann Garamendi, and developed a water conservation plan template for our member agencies. And then finally, in the past several years, we've been working on the 2006 Montgomery Amador Calaveras Integrated Regional Plan. It was adopted originally in 2006, and we're looking to compete for Prop 84 IRWM funding. And over the past couple of years, we've made ourselves eligible for the IRWM programs by getting the authority approved as a regional water management group. Under the law, the only organizations that can participate in the program have to be regional water management groups. A regional water management group is an agency that consists of at least three organizations, two of which have to be water agencies. So I'm going to fit the bill going in. And we also were able to apply for and receive approval of the MAC region, which I'll show you in a second, as an approved IRWM region. And we've done a number of outreach things and established the RPC, which is the Regional Participants Committee. It's the stakeholder committee that's using it to guide the update program. And we are in the process of developing grant applications, which I'll discuss as part of the budget. So, you know, from the county's perspective, dealing with general plans and all the land use planning and all the myriad of other things you've got going on, the Integrated Regional Water Management Program is pretty narrowly focused. Its whole purpose is to encourage integrated regional strategies for managing water resources and providing funding so those agencies and those organizations that are developing these strategies have some assistance in doing on-the-ground implementation. The approved regions are the ones that are eligible for state funding. Again, that's one of the eligibility requirements. And there are specific funding preferences to the state for projects that are within approved regional plans. And if you all recall, I believe it was in 2006, Prop 84 was adopted, and it's authorized $5.3 billion in funding. And some of those funds in the millions and millions of dollars are available for regional plans, implementation projects, and local groundwater assistance grants. So the region that we refer to now as the MAC region, as you can see, is by and large made up of Amador and Calaveras County, with a large portion of Alpine County being defined as the upper reaches of the McCallum watershed. Amador County is pretty much entirely included within the region, and almost all of Calaveras County is included, although you can see that portion in the southern area, that's in portions of the southeast boundary, which is in the Calaveras watershed. And that is being assimilated into the Tuolumne-Stanislaus region, which is a neighboring region just south of the MAC. It's the Stanislaus watershed. Excuse me, Stanislaus. Calaveras County is not included in this. So Calaveras County Water District is participating in both regions. So for the coming year, there are four primary activities that we've got programmed for our IRWM tasks. One, we're looking to prepare and submit an application for funding to update the 2006 plan. Part of that is the 06 plan is based on a lot of things that were in existence in 04 and 05. It needs to be updated just because of changed circumstances. But it also needs to be updated because when the state passed amendments to the act in 09, there are certain things the plan needs to be updated on in order to comply with those new requirements. And we will be applying for a $300,000 grant for a stakeholder-driven process to update that plan. We're also looking to prepare and submit Prop 84 grant applications to fund a number of projects in Amador and Calaveras County. We'll talk about those specifically in a moment. 
We're also um, looking to uh, submit either one or two local groundwater assistance <coughs> grant applications. I've uh, been working with, with Ed and a, um, a groundwater consulting firm out of Davis uh, on a Amador Calaveras fractured rock groundwater study. The idea is to get a better handle on the, the dynamics of the, the groundwater that's in a, a fractured rock region, generally on the west side of Amador and Calaveras County. Um, this is a, a first step. Ideally, what we'd like to know is kind of what the carrying capacity of that uh, fractured rock groundwater basin is. As you know, from the folks in the Valley Springs area, that there's a lot of problems with folks not having a sustainable water supply from their groundwater wells. Uh, this would be basically the first set of tasks to give us a, a boundary on where the fractured rock uh, basin exists and what its basic parameters are. And then finally, we'll contribute a, a modest uh, amount of money to the continuation of the McCullough and Water Supply process. <coughs> So the implementation grant projects that we uh, expect to submit an application by January of next year for. We've had uh, an RPC meeting to discuss this. We've had several UMR governing board meetings, and we've got a short list of projects that are uh, presented here. Um, these all meet the eligibility requirements that are specified in the guidelines that were just released by DWR a couple of weeks back. Um, the, the big project is a, is a Calaveras project. It's a it's a water main and tank replacement project for West Point uh, with an estimated cost of a little over 1.4 million. There are three projects you can see there from Amador uh, Water Agency, uh, generally having to do with um, uh, system uh, leak detection or repair uh, programs. And then finally, at East Panther Creek Dam Removal and Restoration Project, which is an Amador project that's on uh, the Project 137 uh, system, and that's to remove an that old dam that's been uh, breached there uh, for $200,000. So we have about $2.8 million worth of projects that we're looking at, and we'll be narrowing that down over the next coming months and submitting an application. We don't know exactly uh, what the final application will be, but we're looking at somewhere over a couple million dollars. So the UMRA budget for this coming fiscal year, um, because last year we had to amend our budget year and uh, we moved it from a July 1 to June 30th fiscal year to October 1 to September 30th fiscal year because, because of the concerns all the agency members have with funding the authority. And it, we had to work through some issues last year and one of our techniques to keep the programs going was to extend the fiscal year by a quarter. It got a little skinny at the end of the year, but we we did okay. So so this is this is a budget that would um, tentatively take place beginning October first. So it was presented here on the top two left columns of the general tasks and activities along with the total budget, and then you can see the three other columns: the Amador, Calaveras, and East Bay Mud. Uh, I'll refer. I'll talk about about those in a moment. The, the tasks, the, uh, the board and UMRA administration, uh, $36,000. The public school program, that's the uh, public school watershed education program that's, that's taught at um, local public schools in Calaveras and Amador County. There's a line item that uh, funds their activities. We have three different uh, to be determined um, uh, items, and that's those are basically placeholders uh, anticipating that we will receive those grants. Each of those grants will have uh, some dollars attached for uh, grant administration purposes. And whatever those dollar amounts are, they go in those boxes. There would be um, no cost to the member agencies themselves. The uh, $300,000 planning grant uh, that I mentioned earlier, it has a 25% local match. So the local match is being provided there on that next line item. And then finally, there's a $3,000 contribution to continuing the McCullough Forum, which is uh, about a quarter of what the, the uh, expected uh, annual budget would be. So the